Hey, good morning, everyone. Oh, welcome to the session. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer before we start off. Uh, any one of us can pray, please. Let's go ahead. Anyone can pray. Success, would you like to pray? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to come together. Lord, we pray that even as we study your word and learn of God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will minister to us. And Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit, that our hearts will be open to receive your word, to apply your word in each of our lives. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, we last week we completed chapter 20. We looked at retirement, saving, retiring, and beyond. Uh, saving, investing, retiring, and beyond. Uh, today we'll go to the last, there's 20, chapter 21 and chapter 22. Chapter 21 is entrepreneurship. Now we talked a little bit about entrepreneurship earlier on, uh, but let's just look at a few scriptural insights on when we talk about entrepreneurship, it basically means, uh, you know, whether it is starting a, your own business, small scale or a uh, big scale business, or uh, if we translate it to what we are doing in the for the launch. Luke 14, 28 and 30, if one of you is planning to build a tower, you sit down first and figure out what it will cost to see if you have enough money to finish the job. If you don't, you will not be able to finish the tower after laying the foundation and all who see what happened will make fun of you. You began to build but can't finish the job, they will say. Now, now entrepreneurship is a gift. Right, uh, and you know, many of them say it's a gift that people are born with. Right, so some of you know, uh, just just have that entrepreneuring skill, the skills to, uh, you know, to develop new products, develop new ideas. Right, uh, but in entrepreneurship, we must understand that uh, even before we start something, we need to plan it well. Right, so the verse here. Uh, the Lord Jesus is talking about in Luke 14. He's he's talking about this. He's saying, if you're planning to build a tower, first sit down, think about how you're going to do it, plan it out, and then start. Lest you start, and then you're unable to finish it, and people are going to ridicule you, right? Uh, so be clear about the ideas, the business model, the business plan. Uh, uh, have it all on paper. Right? Uh, write it down. Write down your plans. Prepare well before you launch. Now, if it's a ministry that you're starting, you're planning to start, it can be, it need not be a church, but it could be you know, something small uh, uh, that you're planning to start even in your home. Prepare well, right? Put down pros and cons. Okay, these are the pros. Uh, these are the cons. And, and see how you can navigate between the, in the cons, right? Because when you have, uh, you know, you have a long list of, uh, challenges or cons that you see, you need to develop strategies on how you will face those, you know, those challenges, uh, even before you launch something, right? Uh, be diligent about these things, right? Uh, uh, the idea, the business model, your, your, of course, the other things will be your, your values, your, 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 your way of raising up leaders, your, uh, financial, financials, everything, right? You can, you got to be clear on how you do that, right? Now, uh, secondly, determined to do business God's way, apply biblical principles to develop your business, right? Now, especially in the if you're it's in a corporate setting, um, doing business God's way is important yet challenging, right? 
but we can apply biblical principles right to develop our business now when we look at the world uh, a lot of organizations use biblical principles they may not uh, you know they may not believe in the gospel or they may not believe in the bible but biblical principles are definitely being used right uh, Joshua 1 8 says, and don't for a minute let this book of Revelation be out of mind. Ponder and meditate on it day and night. Make sure you practice everything written in it. Then you'll get where you're going. Then you will succeed. Now, you take the context. Paul is uh, sorry, uh, this letter written to Joshua. Uh, Joshua's writing it and he's talking about, he's reminding the people, right? Uh, he's reminding the people of Israel who have come out of this 40 years, they've gone into the promised land, and he's saying, don't let the book of Revelation, meaning don't let what God has spoken to you, uh, you know, just, just be thrown out of the window. Ponder on it, meditate on it, and when you do that, you will succeed. Uh, now, in terms of making decisions, right? We, of course, we all make decisions prayerfully. Uh, so, certain questions that we can ask ourselves right, is when we're making a decision: Do you want to make the decision alone, or if you have partners, do you want to make the decision with partners? Uh, who would, who would be your, you know, your co-founders? Do you want the organization to stay small and a comfortable size, or do you want the organization to become uh, a big, large uh, organization? Do you want to retain control uh, or the power of attorney for the entire organization, or do you want to split it up? Uh, how are the how is the capital, meaning the resources being brought in? How are the resources being sent out? Uh, all these this the, the, all these decisions must be done God's way. Right. Uh, so when we look at God's word, I'm sure there are there are there is a lot that we can learn. Right, uh, entrepreneurial mindset, motivators, behaviors, uh, you know, character development, uh, you know, timeless principles that we can use to establish kingdom priorities, kingdom focus, uh, and especially if it's a church, then. You've got to be full in if it's your own ministry that you're starting. Um, even though it's small, uh, you know, we need to have these in place, right? biblical principles. You know, when a church is small, you may be getting about, example, right? Maybe 10,000 rupees as your monthly, uh, you know, uh, tithes and offerings. Right? I'm talking about a very small church, right? But as the church grows, you have 100, 200, 300 people. All of a sudden, there's a lot of income. A lot of people are giving to the Lord. Then, apart from tithes and offerings, people give for other, um, for other things right? uh, within the church. People give as they are led. How will we, you know, use those resources? How will we use the money? Uh, are we following biblical principles? Right. So these are things when when we start small, and we have these things set in place as we grow. Can follow the same pattern, right? Three, don't be distracted by quick success. You are in for the long haul. Proverbs twenty twenty one. The more easily you get your wealth, the less good it will do you. Right? If we experience quick success, it's wonderful. It's great, but don't let it distract us. Stay focused on the vision, the mission. Stick to the values and the cultures that you have set in place. When we look at, you know, if you look at the corporate sector right now in our nation, there are there are a couple of organizations that we know of, uh, especially you know now with uh, online things going online with these uh, you know apps that are coming in. Uh, you know, success is. Very often, it can be if uh, if a product clicks, it clicks, and success can just happen overnight, right? Uh, when I say overnight, meaning in a short time itself. Uh, so, in ministry, also 
you know, you never know. You know, suddenly you may have a whole, uh, you know, many people coming into your ministry, many people just, uh, you know, giving to your ministry. Now all of a sudden, uh, so for example, you have fifty people now. They are, you know, maybe 500, 600 people in a period of six months. Uh, it's very easy to get distracted with that success. So it's good. It's good to have success. Uh, but it's also important that you stay the course. God, this is what the, the organization stands for. Whether we are 50, whether we are 500, this is, these are certain things. Uh, this is a vision. This is always there in front of us. And we will stick with these values. Right? So don't be distracted with quick success. I would say that when success comes in stages, it's more tastier. It's beautiful when success comes in stages. You, know, you, you just you just relish those. You know you feel okay. Hard work is being paid off. But there will be times right? success just comes, it falls into your lap. Uh, don't be distracted. Don't be hasty for profit. Proverbs twenty eight twenty two. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches, and does not consider that poverty will come upon him. Right now, profit is important, whether it is, uh, you know, in any organization, nobody is running a charity, right? If you're an entrepreneur, you start your business, you're running it for profit, right? You obviously want to see a profit. Uh, if it's ministry, you're not running it for a profit. You trust God to just meet our needs and to provide our needs and to uh, you know, continue to be a blessing. Uh, especially if you're in the corporate sector, don't be hasty for profits, right? Uh, there will be times when you can take shortcuts to make a quick profit, but refuse it, right? Uh, don't compromise on your principles, on your values, just to see success, right? Build strong, even if it means it takes time. Right. Even if it takes time, you build yourself strong. Don't take shortcuts. Right? Um, you know, nowadays, one of the things I've noticed, especially in ministry, is, you know, I, I, I get to speak a lot of, to a lot of young people. And they come and say, hey, I wish I can preach. I wish I can teach. And, you know, just be prophetic, have these words of knowledge. And, it's wonderful. They have the desire. They want to do it. Um, and they want to do it. They genuinely want to grow in the Lord. They want to do it. And one of the questions I ask them, and I purposely ask, is not to, not to bring condemnation, but uh, the reason I ask is so that they can help think and you know improve themselves. And I say, so if you want to get to this place of preaching, teaching, ministering to people and uh, doing all of this uh, go by stages they eventually they what happens is they want to from one level they immediately want to go to the highest level and that's normally you know, how God does not work uh, God works that uh, God does not work that way right he doesn't normally he doesn't do it he takes us through stages but one of the things I always ask them is how how much time are you spending with the Lord? And, uh, and many a times it's, they say, you know, maybe half an hour, 45 minutes. And I tell them that's not enough. Now, if you, if you desire something that is really high, right, of course, there's God's grace that, you know, God does not, you know, is, you know, we're not going, we're not asking, you know, God, I'm going to pray for three hours. Will you make me, give me opportunities? And that's not the point. The point is when we want something, we got to do, you know, there are things that we got to know, got to minister to us, use us in our nation and the nations and all of it. There's a work that we have to do, right? We have to go back, spend time. There is a sacrifice. Right? There's a price that we must pay, right? And 
Of course, when we do that, when God opens those doors for us, it is wonderful because we're not hasty for profit. We're not hasty for success. Uh, and when we when we go through those stages, it's beautiful. It, it, it's, it's basically building a foundation for us, right? First, plant your fields, then build your barns. Uh, Proverbs twenty four twenty seven says that. First, plant your fields, then build your barn. If you build a barn without planting a field, it's going to be empty for a long time until the harvest comes. And if you have built your barn, but you have no plantations there's in your fields, uh, nothing's, it's of no use. Right? Uh, stay focused on what is important and work hard. And just picture this. You have a field. Right? And there's a barn. But we haven't done any plantation. Right? What is the use? Well, we should first plant. And as the plants are growing and it, you know it's time for a harvest, you build a barn. So that whatever is harvested, you take it, you put it in the barn, and everything is settled in the right way. The barn can be built once the fields have been planted. Right, so so plan out. See, uh, remember we talked about this. Know what is important. No, uh, when we talked about, I think it was work-life balance. Know what is important. The the barn is important, yes. But what's more important than the barn? The plants. Right. If I don't do the A and I'm directly going to the B, who'll do the A? Right. So first plant your fields, then build your barns. So basically, what we're trying to say is, do what is important first, and out of that, do the other things. Right? One of the important things that I always tell when I meet, you know, we very occasionally we meet pastors from different villages and rural areas. And the first thing I ask them is, uh, have you registered your church? And most of them don't even know what is the vision. They don't. There's no vision. It's just a church, you know. We don't blame them because they just started off um, uh, in their home and uh, not very learned. Uh, one of the things I encourage uh, them to do is get to a lawyer and get the church registered. Because when you do that, you're doing it in the right way, right? Uh, keep a close eye on what brings in the bread and butter. Proverbs 27, 23 to 27. Look after your sheep and cattle as carefully as you can. Because wealth is not permanent. Not even nations last forever. You cut the hay and then cut the grass on the hillsides while the next crop of hay is growing. You can make clothes from the wool of your sheep and buy land with the money you get from selling some of your goats. The rest of the goats will provide milk for you and your family and for your servant woman as well. Right? So as your business takes shape, right, there will be many things that are critical, many non-essentials, many non-critical things that come up. Right? There are many things, many things that can come as distractions. Now, choose, there are opportunities may, which may come in, which we may have to say no to, right? Uh, stick to what is good for your business. Now, when we look at it, in a, when we talk about ministry, right, there will be many opportunities that come our way. Now, we must prayerfully see, is it in line with what I want to do? Is it in line with the ministry? Is it in line with the vision? Is it is it going to be something that is, you know, uh, going to build the kingdom of God, right? The overall picture. Is it going to bless people's lives? Is it going to raise up discipleship, uh, or, or is it going to, you know, increase in ministry evangelism? Are these going to th these things going to happen? So choose. Think about it. What is, you know, uh, keep a close eye. 
whether this is you know in the entrepreneurial sense your bread and butter meaning when your income where where is the uh, place where you you get the most income and in the ministry side where is the place where you can be more effective right uh, and so think about that as well keep a close eye on the core of your business or the core of your ministry stay clear of pride that comes with success proverbs 16:18 pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall now obviously you know when a ministry is small or when a business is small nobody is uh, you're not uh, you know, nobody is looking at you nobody is even talking about you but as the business grows as the ministry grows uh stay clear this is a heart condition right uh stay clear and and stay away from pride um always acknowledge god as you continue to walk in humility continue to uh you know operate in the principles of god and we all know that is destructive right is dangerous right uh whether it is in the corporate whether in ministry and uh, and it's sad to say that right now when we look at ministry you know uh pride has caused so much so much of trouble and many leaders have fallen because of pride right so that's a hard attitude we need to make sure that we don't fall for it right your personal income and benefits keep it right now uh for example you're an entrepreneur your business is growing uh you know of course you know you'll you you'll need your income from that right so uh, uh, uh you know pay yourself well there are benefits within the organization organization use it but let it be equal to all of them who are in the workplace so for example uh, now you're a, uh, if for example you're an entrepreneur you're the leader because you pay yourself well and then pay your team also well keep it right and uh, uh, and when you also when you do this also make sure that you're not indulging yourself too much right avoid excesses avoid things that you feel that you wouldn't need um, you know uh, you don't have to you know live to prove other people right? you see what you need what is been, what is needed for you and that's more than enough right we don't have to live to prove hey you know see this is what i do this is what you don't have to do that so basically this walking in humility and keeping things right uh multiply what you have by empowering others matthew 13 31 and 32 jesus told them another parable the kingdom of heaven is like this A man takes a mustard seed and sows it in his field it is the smallest of all seeds but when it grows up it is the biggest of all plants it becomes a tree so that the birds come and make their nests on its branches multiply what you have by empowering others you can empower other people in many other ways by right? providing education um paying for their education providing them with small job opportunities um you know uh, providing them with you know you know family benefits health insurance uh simple things right uh, medical uh, help uh you can empower others to be self sufficient right uh by helping them start small businesses um uh, you know rural uh, in rural settings now what about in ministry uh you know this is what we are called to do right empower others raise up other leaders so we do that we help uh, rural churches smaller churches smaller ministries plant ministries build ministries uh and we are able to look after them right uh, so multiplying by empowering others and finally the woman entrepreneur can be a virtuous wife mother and homemaker right now as a woman right speaking to all the women here uh if god has called you to be an entrepreneur wonderful right but also be a virtuous wife mother and be there for your family right uh it's wonderful right and we we always believe that 
you know, men and women are equal. God has created us alike. We have the same Holy Spirit inside of us. So God can use us powerfully, women. God can use you powerfully, right? Or give you wisdom to start businesses, multiply businesses, uh, you know, to be a manager of both the house, the family, the children, and also be an entrepreneur. And uh, this is wonderful because when we do this, uh, you know, it, it's a virtuous woman, as the book of Proverbs talks about, right? So uh, we complete this chapter. Let's get into the last chapter, uh, chapter 22. Any questions? Any questions on this chapter? I know we just uh, we, we're just touching the, uh, the entrepreneurship is a big big topic. We can talk about it for days, and there's a lot of material. But these are just a few pointers, uh, and I I'm just trying to translate both in the workplace and in ministry. So, any questions? Shall we get to the last chapter? It's a small chapter, workplace transformation. Okay. So workplace transformation. What is tra transformation? Oh, you know, uh, you and I, each one of us, whichever sphere of influence that God has put us in, we can be an influence in that place. We can change things around in that sphere of influence, right? Now, how do we do that? It's not going to happen overnight. It's not going to happen just by you know, just by doing it on our own strength. Workplace transformation happens when we when we use the principles of God, when we have certain godly principles, and we begin to reflect that in our work. Right? Uh, and each one of us, right, let's, you know, wherever we are, it could be the most meager job that we're doing. We can cause a transformation. Now it could be just you know three, four people believing in you know or seeing us, and uh, three or four of our colleagues seeing and talking about us. That's a workplace transformation because things are changing. People are looking. People are watching. Right, so let's look at a few points on how you and I can be agents of transformation in our workplace. First one, initiate a culture shift. Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth. 13, Matthew 5, 13 through 16, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What a wonderful example Jesus comes up with, right? In this the Beatitudes, he says, You are the salt and you are the light. Salt permeates, light penetrates. Right? And as followers of Jesus, Salt and light both influence our environment. Both influence. Imagine there's darkness. When you switch on the light, there's light. The light is not thinking twice, oh, should I come on? No. Um, and if there's food without salt, it could be the most expensive food. But without salt, it's going to be tasteless. But the moment you add salt to it, it is transformed. The taste changes. When you when you're in a in a dark room, the moment you switch on the light, the place is transformed. It's gone from darkness to light. And we have been commissioned. Jesus is saying, "You are the salt. You are the light." And wherever you are, we can influence the world. Right? We. We can influence the world by initiating a culture shift, a change in the mindset that accepts things the way they are. Right? You do this by walking in the timeless principles that God has for us. You do this by walking in the character of Christ. Wherever we are, 
we can be salt and light. We are commissioned to be that. Now, is it going to be easy? No. Is it possible? Yes. It is definitely possible. Right? And I have plenty of examples of, you know, uh, remember this happened in, uh, uh, I forget which revival was this, uh, Workman's Revival, I think it was that, where uh, these, these uh, two men who were in the corporate sector, it happened in the early, early 1800s, uh, early 1900s, uh, who were working business well. And one of them had this whole, you know, reading the Beatitudes, had this whole thing, hey, I'm called to be salt and light, but I'm not doing anything about it. So he decided we will begin a prayer for 15 minutes in the office during the break time. And this is when? During the time there was no cell phones, no, you know, uh, laptops, nothing, right? And they started this prayer. And this prayer went on for many, many, many years, causing a whole outpouring, a whole revival. It started off with two people. And we talked about revivals of God, and we saw the Welsh revival, the, uh, uh, the different revivals that happened over the years. All started off small, but it, it shifted the culture of the entire society. Right? Uh, we can be an initiator for culture shift in our place, wherever we are. Right? Create a constructive change. Matthew 13, 33, another parable he spoke to them. The kingdom of God is like leaven which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till it was leavened. Right? It only takes a small amount of yeast to affect the entire dough which is mixed. The kingdom of God is so. Just a little bit of yeast is able to affect the entire dough. Just a little bit of the glory of God, the power of God, and God using just a few of us can affect the entire dough. The entire workplace can be changed. So what do we need? We need the power of God. We need the power of the kingdom, kingdom values, kingdom authority to be released through us. We start small. Now, many times people come and say, hey, those days, you know, revival was there because there was a need. Now there's no need. And that's not true. There is a need for revival. Right? There is a need. There is so much need for a revival. And when we look at you know the book of revelations and we talk about those the three and a half years great tribulation we look at a great world revival that is going to happen through the two witnesses and many other believers right so revival is needed it's it's a constant it, it is needed every moment until the coming of the lord right so create constructive changes in the workplace right in, the, in an environment where there is dishonesty and corruption, step in and demonstrate integrity and challenge people to do the same. In an environment where there is hostility and strife, step in and demonstrate love and kindness. In an environment where there's injustice and abuse, step in and demonstrate justice and the goodness of God. In an environment where there is greed, and self-aggrandizement, step in. Aggrandizement means self, uh, you know, there's this pride you know, or, 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 or a feeling of, you know, wanting to be known and famous and popular. Step into the place and uh, challenge and demonstrate sharing and generosity. Now, trying to be a change. Uh, you know, trying to be this salt and light calls for wisdom, calls for courage, calls for strength. People may ridicule, people may mock at us, uh, but you know, if if God has called us to be salt and light, uh, we are to do our best 
for it to be that, right? Next one, be a transformational leader. John 10, 11 through 14. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd puts the sheep before himself, sacrifices himself if necessary. A hired man is not a real shepherd. The sheep mean nothing to him. He sees a wolf come and runs for it, leaving the sheep to be ravaged and scattered by the wolf. He is only in it for the money. The sheep don't matter to him. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep. My own sheep know me. There are two kinds of shepherds Jesus is talking about here. One is a shepherd who is a good shepherd. And he's looking after his own sheep. Even if a wolf comes, he's willing to stand. A wolf or a bear or a lion, he's willing to stand, put his life on the line to protect his sheep. And we have another shepherd who's, if the sheep is not his, and the moment he sees his life is in danger, he's going to run away and the sheep are destroyed. Right? Which kind of leader do we want to be? Good leaders care and serve for the people they serve the people they lead. The others do it just for themselves. Now you and I are called to be transformational leaders, right? Where he, if if we want to, you know, transform an organization, if we want to transform communities, we need transformational leadership. And we can use this value, this value that God is teaching us. And be there to care, to protect, and to provide for your team. Teach them, right? A good shepherd does not only, you know, uh, you know, love and care, but he also corrects and instructs, leads them in the right way. Right? So you, we got to balance both of these. I can't, uh, yes, there's love, there's care, all of it, but there's also correction, instruction, exhortation. Right? All of it uh, should be there in a transformational leader. Right? Finally, last one, demonstrate the kingdom in the workplace. Acts 17, 16 and 17. Now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. So later on, we see in this in this chapter, Acts 17, we see that uh, Paul goes on to preach in Athens. And what happens? There's a shift, right? The, they call him to Mars Hill, the place where the Areopagus, he preaches the gospel there and people believe in Jesus and a church is started. What happened? He demonstrated kingdom values. He demonstrated the power of God's kingdom in that place. God is interested and God is involved in our workplace today. Our, no our knowledge, our science, technology, our, our, and all our intellectual prowess we have gained uh, have divested the workplace from the presence and the power of God. But remember, it is God who gives us the knowledge the wisdom, the technology, everything was given by God. So we need to let people know how to experience and how to walk in this knowledge of God. Right? We have, you know, there are a lot of things that we can do. Uh, you know, we can always rely on the supernatural. Right? There are things that science and technology cannot explain. If you've got a friend in the workplace who's, who's, you know, well, I can share this. Many years back, this man was, you know, he, he, a friend of mine in the workplace, not a friend, but he would always mock and ridicule and he, was, he would be really upset. Whenever he sees me, he would be angry. Uh, but one day he came up to me and he said, you are this Jesus boy and all, right? So, you know, this is what's happening in my home. Mother is... Uh, going through this sickness, this illness for many years. Um, and I'm not going to ask you to pray, but you know, if, if there is a God, my mother is a good 
you know, good woman. She, she, you know, we lost our father at a young age. She's the only one uh, that is there for me. And uh, if, if even if she dies, uh, you know, anyway, I don't believe in God. So, uh, what kind of a God will you know do these kind of things? And she was just upset and angry with me. Uh, and I remember telling him, "Hey, it's, it's." It's the way God works with people. It's not God's fault. Uh, and he was not willing to, uh, you know, listen. And I remember telling him, "Can can we pray for your mother?" And he said, "You pray. I'm not going to pray." Right? And we prayed. And I remember after a couple of days, he came back and he said, "My mother is discharged from the hospital. The doctors don't know how everything became all right." And this really changed his mind right he stopped ridiculing mocking he stopped using over time he stopped using bad words he stopped getting angry with people and next thing i noticed that he would come and sit next to me every time when we were in office and he began to spend a lot of time with me he began to come for those morning prayers which had started uh and you know god just changed him just there's a big transformation in his life uh, from this arrogant, rude person to just being quiet and very humble. Uh, and I'm surprised of his humility. He became so humble that it didn't matter to him what people say, what people spoke. He became very humble. Uh, how is that? It's because of the Holy Spirit, right? And God is calling us to demonstrate this kind of kingdom principles in the workplace, wherever we are in our workplace, in our communities, right? Pray that God can, you know, use us right, through the gifts of the Spirit, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit to demonstrate the values of God uh, wherever we are. So that way we will truly be salt and light. All right. So we have completed our portions. Um, thank you so much, each one of you, for journeying along. Uh, I really enjoyed studying this and uh, reading and teaching this uh, entire book and I, I just pray and believe that each one of us including me we will continue to use these principles and uh, continue to reflect on them use them for the glory of god right any questions any thoughts before we close for this semester no questions okay all right, so let's just close in prayer. Maybe one of us can just pray. Just thank the Lord for this entire semester, for this entire study, and uh, we'll close. Uh, would anyone like to close in prayer? Yeah, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this course. Whatever we have learned, Jesus, we thank you for uh, guiding us throughout this whole course, helping us to understand a lot about how to conduct ourselves, how to reflect you in the workplace, Jesus. God, I pray that whatever we have learned, we will put it into practice. We will be doers of the world. Let us not forget anything that we have learned so that we can glorify you through our life, through our actions. No matter where we go, we can reflect you, your love, your kindness, your compassion. And God, we can lift your name above all else. I thank you for all my classmates. We thank you for Pastor Paul. We thank you for blessing him with your knowledge so that he can be a blessing to others. Be with us and guide us throughout the session. Lord, we thank you for this whole semester, everything that we have learned. We give you all the glory, all the honor. With a grateful heart, we say a big thank you to you, Jesus. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jafina. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a wonderful break, and uh, I'll see you next semester. God bless. Bye now.